Welcome. So we're just chatting off camera with some of our, our, our students and our guests tonight, but it's just so exciting to see so many people that are, that are interested in a wine class uh, coming from countries and a region that you may not have as much familiarity with, an area that is more difficult to travel in, although there are certainly in the last decade or so um, have become more open to tourists and traveling and infrastructure. Um, I'd love to maybe share some of my experiences with you traveling in the country, although not all of them were wine related or in the countries, I should say. Uh, but if any of you have been to any of the countries that we're discussing tonight, of course, I'd love to hear your take um, in the comments. I also just want to be sensitive tonight that, you know, this is also a region we're talking about areas that are very close to Ukraine, areas that have been heavily impacted by uh, like the Soviet Union and heavily impacted by Russia. So um, although we're not including like Ukraine or Moldova or anywhere like that in our discussion tonight, and that's simply because it's not considered to be part of the, the Balkan Peninsula itself. Obviously, we're talking about um, a subject in wine regions that are very close. So, um, you know, hopefully we we can pay our, you know, pay our respects and be respectful about what's going on uh, while still keeping to the topic at hand here as well. Um, has anybody been to the Balkans or Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia? Yeah, or I, I work there a lot, so I know the region pretty well. Do you go often or do you work with people there? Um, I Pre-COVID, I'd go there often. In fact, just got back from a trip a couple of months ago um, that went to Bosnia and then um, Bulgaria. So, yeah. Well, wow, that's amazing. Uh, so I had the opportunity to, I've spent, um, I, I've been on kind of three separate trips to some of these areas. Uh, the first one was about 10 years ago. I, I did a, a trip uh, partially by myself and partially with my cousin um, through all, all of the Balkans, really, um, everywhere except Greece. Um, and Greece is considered part of the Balkan Peninsula, but we just recently did a class on Greece, so we won't include it today. Um, and my experience is I went during the winter. This was a decade ago. So depending on where you were, again, the infrastructure was not really set up for tourism yet. Um, besides the fact of being in the off season, the most common thing I, I got asked is, why are you here in it was like February or something like that? Um, and I was there traveling around the area for a few months. Um, I've been back since to visit friends in Serbia that I made uh, on that first trip. And I've been back to visit the wine region of Bulgaria again as well. So I do have some um, some limited, but some firsthand knowledge of traveling in the region. Um, we're not gonna talk a lot about getting around today, just because as I mentioned, the first time I went has been 10 years ago. So I'm sure that my, um, <laughs> my pro tips on the buses and trains to take may not be as the most useful to you anymore these days. But if you do have any questions, as always, you know, we'd love to hear, um, hear what you have to say, hear your tips if you have any. I mean, that sounds absolutely amazing, Mary, because you probably know more about traveling in the region than anybody on this call. Um, but we're here to talk about wine, as usual. Mary, do you have an opportunity to taste a lot of wine when you're there? Um, I can't, uh, I can't quite hear you for some reason, but that's okay. So if you do have a, if you know of any producers that you think are really worth seeking out or any wineries, um, I'm sort of staying away from listing wineries today because so many of them are just not available in the U.S. or maybe not available everywhere. Um, so kind of try to stay away from that, but um, I might pepper in a couple of, of important ones as we come to it here and there. All right, let's go ahead and just get us all set up here. Okay, cool. So we're talking about the Balkans. Uh, looking at a map that does include uh, the surrounding areas of the Balkans as well. Um, surrounded by water, it is considered to be a peninsula, the Adriatic Sea, the Ionian Sea. 
um, parts of the Mediterranean, uh, and then also uh, many rivers that are quite important to the eastern area of Europe as well, especially in places like Serbia that might be landlocked also. So we'll do just a little bit of background and history because um, this is really a region that in both its wine, its political, its cultural history, uh, this area had been through a lot. Uh, so sometimes because it's been so isolated at different points in its history, it's hard to really understand that we have this this incredibly rich cultural history. Of course, any, anywhere we know that we have kind of a rich cultural history on the European continent, we usually have a history of wine and beverages as well. So we'll just talk briefly through um, the kind of overall general history of this peninsula. We might talk a little bit about the individual countries when we do come to those as well. Um, so what is the Balkans? Uh, it's a collection of countries in Southeastern Europe. Um, I mentioned it's bordered by the Adriatic, the Ionian, the Aegean Sea, the Black Sea, separating it from places like Georgia, of course, uh, and the Danube River, an incredibly important um, kind of uh, almost roadway, right? The river of commerce throughout uh, the Balkans and Eastern Europe. For the countries that are entirely within the Balkan Peninsula, they include Albania, Bosnia, and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Greece, Montenegro, and what's today known as North Macedonia. And it includes parts of Serbia, Croatia, and Slovenia as well. Um, we'll also be talking about, some people do consider Romania to be, I did include Romania today in one of the slides. Uh, so some people do kind of uh, include Romania to be partly within the peninsula as well. Um, but some of these borders are a little bit contested um, on all sides, wherever you can go. So some people consider uh, not just the sea, the, the, the ocean surrounding it, but sometimes rivers and mountains to be the actual border. So they are contested a bit. The area, the melting pot of different languages, faith, civilization, it is multi-ethnic. Um, it is politically diverse as well. It's the first area in Europe to experience the arrival of farming cultures in the Neolithic area. And it's the route by which farming spread into Europe from the Middle East. So it's pretty, pretty incredible. They're the location of the first advanced civilization uh, with culture developing forms of proto writing even before the Minoans, who we think were one of the first. It is a junction of the Latin and Greek bodies of the Roman Empire. It is the destination of a massive influx of pagans. And also it's the area where both Orthodox and Catholic Christianity met, as well as Christianity and Islam. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was really a controlling force in the region uh, by the end of the 16th century, and the frequent wars uh, within the Ottoman Kingdom and the isolation really kept this area from the mainstream of economic advance, right? Western Europe sort of shifted its commerce um, more and more towards the Atlantic, and this really set the Balkans up to be one of the least developed parts of Europe. Um, and I think that that, you know, I haven't been for I've, last time I went to the Balkans that was in Bulgaria in 2018. So it certainly has been, um, you know, quite a bit of time since I've been there. Um, but, you know, as I mentioned, the very first time I went in 2012, it was not easy to get through all of these countries. Um, there was not a lot of infrastructure for travel. In some places, there was not very much infrastructure for hotels, uh, especially if you went into places like Albania. Most of the nation states in the peninsula emerged during the 19th and 20th century um, as they declared independence from either the Ottoman or the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, Serbia and Montenegro in 1878, Romania in 1881, Bulgaria in 1908, um, Albania in 1912, and Greece in 1921. And there's more. <laughs> We had several wars. So, and this is a very, very, I also just pause myself here. This is an extremely truncated history. So don't take this as, uh, you know, this is the only wars and strife that happened within the region, because as you know, with this kind of crossroads of culture and religion, um, there, there was a lot of, of, a lot of disagreements, we should say, right? So the First and Second Balkan War took place um, mostly because countries wanted to be united in alliance against the Ottoman Empire in the case of the First Balkan War. 
The World War I was sparked in the Balkans initially in 1914 uh, when a revolutionary organization uh, assassinated the Austro-Hungarian heir, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo, which is located in Bosnia and, and Herzegovina. This caused the war between Austria, Hungary and Serbia. And because of this sort of uh, throughout this existing chain of alliances, uh, this is one of the things that really led to setting up the First World War. After the First War, numerous pacts and treaties aligned the, Bal the Balkan countries with or without the Axis Pact. And apart from Greece, uh, the major all of the Balkan countries were allies of Nazi Germany at the start of World War II. So those really kind of sets up this area for obviously what the, what happened later on and becoming sort of behind the Iron Curtain of the Soviet Union that we discussed, right? So the region was left divided between Axis alleys and the region really suffered a lot of hardship. The people um, were very repressed. There was a lot of starvation throughout the occupation. At the end of 1944, when the Soviets entered Romania and Bulgaria and forced the Germans out of the Balkans, most of these countries fell behind the Iron Curtain. So most of the Balkan countries were governed by communist governments. Um, Yugoslavia and Albania. So Yugoslavia was a collection of countries under uh, a ruler, a dictator named Tito, and Albania was under the leadership or dictator of a, of a, um, a man named Enver Hoda, who initially was aligned with uh, both Yugoslavia were, and Albania were aligned with Russia. Albania fell out with the Soviet Union. They looked more toward communist China, but then really eventually fell into like really isolationist um, politics and Albanians were were really not allowed to I mean they were they were not allowed to travel people were not allowed in and out of the country when I went to Albania in 2012 uh, I had to find a way to get into the country um, and I kept going because I was already planning on doing this so I mean it wasn't you know it was a little disconcerting but ended up being you can take a train there but well the train stops at a station um, in Montenegro and doesn't go any further. Okay, well then you can walk down from the train station and you can go catch this bus. Well, the bus goes a little while and then stops in a town and says it's not going actually into Albania. So then you get a cab, you take a cab across the border and then you find another bus to take you into, <laughs> into Tirana. So it really was um, uh, quite an experience, but I'm glad that I was able to see what that was like. So, in the 1990s, the transition of these regions um, and the ex Eastern Bloc countries turned towards more of a democratic free market. Um, and a lot of these went somewhat peacefully, but in the former Yugoslav republics, uh, war broke out between the countries of, the, of former Yugoslavia. So primarily involved were Serbia, Croatia, uh, Montenegro. At the, at the dissolution of Yugoslavia, six countries were recognized, Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, what we know today as North Macedonia, Montenegro, and Serbia. In 2008, Kosovo declared independence from, from Serbia. Um, Serbia today still doesn't uh, entirely recognize this independence. The US was one of the first countries to recognize Kosovo's independence when this took place. And in 2019 of February, the Socialist Republic of Macedonia becomes known as the Republic of North Macedonia. So most people will still just refer to it as Macedonia. We'll talk about it today. Um, there is wine that comes out of the country. Uh, I thought when I was there it was referred to it like the former Yugoslav public, Republic of Macedonia, but I might be wrong. So um, one of the reasons that they changed their name as well to include North Macedonia is because of a dispute with Greece, who actually has again, a wine growing region and uh, just an area of the same name. So Macedonia is a part of Greece, not included in the country of Macedonia itself as well. Um, and I, again, I'd love to hear anybody's comments if they have any, because, um, you know, it's a lot of history. It's not a place that, even though it's a place that I have been and have interest in, uh, you know, I'd love to hear other people, other people's thoughts as well. So let's start off with some of these countries. So you have a choice. Um, you can drink indigenous wines if you can find them, or you can drink international grape varieties. Both can be great, right? We know that. We talk about interna international grape varieties. We love Pinot Noir. We love Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc and Riesling and Cabernet Franc 
and uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, right? These are all wines that we know and enjoy from other parts of the world. And there's a couple of things that sort of happen in, in a lot of different countries, um, but especially in the Balkans or these areas that were coming out from under communist rule uh, and engaging in a free market system for the first time, right? Uh, one of the things is that they needed products to sell. And oftentimes selling their indigenous grape varieties uh, wasn't really what a lot of wine consumers, especially coming out in the 80s and 90s of these areas, were familiar with. So planting international grape varieties, although I think today we really see that shift where I think one of the, the greatest things of interest in the wine world is exploring these countries and these regions that have kept these grape varieties that have over decades or centuries um, really come to be perfect for the terroir or the, the climate that they're being grown in. But planting international grape varieties can bring cash flow, right? It's recognizable on the global market. It's going to be easier to pronounce and define than something called Fatasca Alba or Fatasca Regala, right? So a lot of these uh, international grape varieties that were planted, especially in places like Romania and Bulgaria, which we'll talk about next, really helped bring in a lot of cash flow that was uh, really needed after, after communism in these areas. So it's a lot of high quality, uh, excuse me, high quantity and poor quality behind the Iron Curtain. Um, although, you know, wine isn't, isn't always uh, kind of drinking and wine isn't always uh, pushed or, or, you know, it's tolerated, but it's not always um, the word I'm looking for. Sorry, sometimes my brain just like leaves me. Um, it's tolerated, but it's not necessarily like necessarily welcomed in some of, some of these sort of places, right? Like communism, Soviet Union, things like that. But even so, the Soviets obviously saw the, the economic advantage of wine, of planting grapes, growing wine and then selling it, right? So they really expanded vineyard acreage. One of the things, especially that they did in places like Romania and Bulgaria was plant um, high yielding disease resistant hybrids on flat land. They established gigantic state run cooperatives. Um, they encouraged a lot of quantity over quality of the wines, of course, so that they could just make wine and sell it for money. It wasn't really considered an artisanal product. In 1989, after the fall of, uh, of communism, a lot of these areas are, a lot of these wineries are privatized. And we begin to see a refocus on quality, as well as uh, a lot of investment from international, um, international investors, people outside of the country, right? We still see um, a leading stake in European, Eastern European wine production, even though in the past, you know, 20, 30 years, we have dramatically re reduced, especially in Romania and Bulgaria, the amount of wine that we actually produce. But Romania is still a leader in terms of um, Eastern European production. So what do we see for some of these grape varieties and wine regions that we might expect? So the country's two most planted grapes, and Romania is a, is a white wine loving country. The majority of what Romanians drink is white wine. It is the preferred, I mean, majority by maybe around like 60%. So it's not like only what they drink, but it is probably the preferred style of wine. Most commonly within the country, you'll see uh, the two indigenous grapes, uh, Fatasca Alba and Fatasca Regala. These are the countries most planted. The Alba tends to be a little bit more on the floral side and sometimes the Regala can be a little bit more on the mineral side is what I've heard. I haven't had a ton of opportunities to taste these wines side by side. You'll also see international grape varieties, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Muscat Atenel, Pinot Gris and Riesling Italico, also known as Welsh Riesling. For red grapes, uh, Romania has the primarily, uh, uh, excuse me, international grape varieties, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Sauvignon, but you might find some of their indigenous red grapes as well, Fatasca Negra, uh, Bourgogne Mare, Babesca Negra, and then uh, this one, I always, I forgot, I forgot to ask too if there's anybody on the call that speaks any of these, uh, these 
Eastern kind of Balkan, Eastern European languages. Um, but this one here, Roseora, is known as Pamid in Bulgaria, which we'll talk about. It makes like a really light, fresh style of wine. It can be used for sparkling or light rosés. Um, it's considered to be sort of an easy drinking, everyday table wine. In 2002, Romania moved its wine classification more in line with what you would expect in the EU. Um, and they split their quality system into two main categories. Uh, this is one of my favorites because I think it's one of the easiest to understand in the wine rule, in the wine world. So the first category is wines for current consumption. Uh, these are table wines, everyday drinking wines. They're meant to be inexpensive. As you know, I would love to say they're meant to lubricate the conversation. You have them when you're going out um, in, you know, where are you going? You're going out in Bucharest, you're going out in Timisoara, you're going out in Brazov after a day of skiing. Um, what are you drinking? Wines for current consumption. The wines for current consumption are in two categories, so VM and VMS. Uh, VMS will be slightly more superior, but you can think of these as sort of your, your general regional styles of wine, right? They'll come from one of the seven sort of major regions, which we're going to look at in Romania. If you have superior table wine, um, they'll be a slightly more restrictive than just the table wines, the Vin de Massa, right? So they'll be higher quality grape varieties, um, probably require things like lower yields um, and so forth. And then the quality, the top quality is quality wines. So you'll see two types of quality wines. So we have VS. This is essentially a PGI style of wine as well. PGI wines have to come from one of the seven major regions. Um, the, uh, these are lower yields. Um, these are higher quality grape varieties. These are higher standards of winemaking as well. And then the top tier would be the DOC. So it's called the DOC, similar to what you hear in, or the same as what you hear in Italy. Um, this is your PDO style of wine. You can use only recommended and authorized grape varieties. Um, this does not include using any hybrid grapes, so Vitis vinifera. Uh, the wine must come from one of the seven major regions. So also in Romania, we have a region known as Moldova or in Moldovia. It is on the border of the Republic of Moldova. Um, but it is a separate wine growing region within Romania. So kind of confusing about the Macedonia, the country and Macedonia, the wine region or the region in Greece, right? Uh, Dobrogea over here on the Black Sea, Multinia and Oltinia, Banat uh, and Crisana Maramures. These two regions, um, we don't have a lot to say about because they don't really have a lot of wine that comes into the US. Primarily what you're going to see are wine from Transylvania, the last region that we need to mention, uh, Moldovia and maybe Dobrogea as well, or Multinia and Oltenia. So one of seven major regions. And then you might also see some additional information on the label. So along with the DOC, you'll see these acronyms uh, for different styles of wine, of how the wines essentially were harvested. So in a way, similar to uh, the system of picking grapes in Alsace, or perhaps picking grapes in Germany, somewhere like the Mosul or the Rheingau, right? So you might see the acronym CMD on a bottle of uh, DOC level wine. This means the grapes were harvested at full maturity. Well, I mean, this really should be the basis of quality, right? All grapes that we drink, um, or all wines that we drink from grapes should be harvested at full maturity. This, means, this just means that we have the right level of balance between ripeness and acidity. The tannins are ripe. We don't have green off-putting flavors in our wine. Um, it's not too acidic and so forth. So harvested at full maturity. Uh, you might see CT on the label, and this is indicating a late harvested grape. So this would be closer to maybe in somewhere like Alsace, maybe we would say like the Vendage Tardive, um, or in somewhere like Germany, probably more of the Spate Laser, or maybe the Aus Laser category if there's no botrytis affecting the grapes as well. So these are late harvested grapes. They have uh, more ripeness and concentration of flavor. Um, they have these kind of richer, more honeyed characteristics to the wine. They can have some sweetness, but they don't necessarily have to. So that would be a producer decision of whether they're leaving some of that natural sugar in the wine or not. And then the CIB, you have botrytis affected grapes. So these are grapes that are affected by the noble rot, both uh, desiccating the grape 
uh, concentrating all that sugar, right? Um, but also adding those concentrated fruit flavors that you get from that raisinating of the grape um, and that aging, right? And then sometimes you get flavors from bet the botrytis, the actual noble rot itself. People say like ginger and saffron can be really common here as well. The Carpathian Mountains dominate the center of the country. Um, and you can't see it quite as well on this map, but essentially it's just a sort of like a backward C-shaped a mountain range that sort of hooks its way right around uh, the eastern and southern side of, Trent, of the region of Transylvania. And then you have the Danube River down here at the bottom separating uh, Bulgaria as well. So what are some of the major regions that you might see here? You're going to Bucharest, um, you know, for a weekend out. Maybe you're going to go there for your next, um, you know, bachelor party, bachelorette party. Maybe you want to go to somewhere like Timisoara um, or Cluj Napoca. Spend the weekend as well. Uh, Lindsay, I don't know where you went. I saw that you put in the chat that you went to Romania as well. So maybe you have a few places that you really love. So some of the main wine growing regions. So Moldova. Uh, Moldova that you find here in the northeast. The most famous wine growing region is an area called Kotnari DOC. Um, so this region is most famous for its sweet white wine, although more frequently recently they're being made in those sort of like dry aromatic styles. Most commonly the Kotnari DOC wine will be made from a grape known as Grasa di Kotnari uh, with other local indigenous grape varieties that you might find uh, blended in as well. The Tamayosa Romanesca uh, tends to have this really like resiny um, uh, sort of incense aroma to it as well. These wines can be blended and they can also be vinified and bottled uh, as a single varietal as well. So again, the more, more uh, traditional style is sweet wines, but we're really beginning to see an increase in those dry table wines as well. In Multania Opinia, uh, Dilu Mare, the DOC, is known for the high quality red wines that they produce from international grape varieties, primarily Cabernet Sauvignon and Pinot Noir. We mentioned Banat and Cristana Maramores as well, up here on the, uh, the western side of the country. And uh, close to the Black Sea, we have the Brogia uh, Mufatlo DOC, also known for more traditional indigenous whites, but also um, traditionally a late harvest style of Chardonnay. We see Cabernet Sauvignon, Pinot Noir for the reds. And then, of course, Transylvania. So Tarnave DOC is uh, one of the, the coolest in terms of temperature region um, and most important. These are high acid sort of zesty styles of uh, white wine coming from the local grape varieties, usually from the Fateasca grapes, but even from something that you might find like uh, the Traminer, kind of a Traminer Rosé, kind of like a, almost like a spiced, uh, richer white style of wine as well. So when you're heading south, uh, you're going to go right into Bulgaria. So you're going across the Danube River. Um, Bulgaria uh, is a really is a really interesting place um, in its in its wine arc of evolution. Um, it is certainly one of the oldest places of civilization uh, that we that we know of within Europe. Um, in the late after the history that we do know of. So also behind, uh, you know, Romania and Bulgaria were also, they were not part of Yugoslavia. Uh, they were not associated with Enver Hoda doing his own communist thing over in Albania, but they were also both ruled by, um, uh, by, by communist um, leaders, you would loosely call them, right? Um, they were also, behind the Iron Curtain, they were also led by communism during this time, um, even though they were led by different dictators, I would say. Um, in the late 70s and the early 80s, they were really uh, sort of the, the vineyard of the Soviet Union. Uh, they pumped out a lot of wine. During the 80s, the early 80s, they were the world's fourth largest exporter of wines. Um, a lot of that did go to Russia. Um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, uh, PepsiCo became really interested 
and bringing its product to some of these Eastern communist markets. Um, and they found their first in, uh, as far as I understand, in Bulgaria. Well, the, the Bulgarian, I forget what the, um, the currency was called. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think that they, even though they're part of the EU, I don't think that they use, you, you probably would know, Mary, I don't think that last time I was there, they weren't using the euro. Um, and I think that they probably still don't. I think they do use their own currency. Um, but the currency was so low at the time in the 1970s that they were actually being paid, PepsiCo was being paid with wine because it was actually worth more than the currency of Bulgaria at the time. So they noticed that, you know, the wine wasn't really, even though Bulgaria was making a lot of it, exporting a lot of it, the quality really wasn't there. Again, it was the same idea, extremely high quantity, very, very moderate to low quality as well. Uh, so PepsiCo decided to bring in some consultant from other parts in the world to see if they could improve the quality of the wine coming out of Bulgaria. Uh, one of the professors or one of the consultants that they choose to bring in was a man named uh, Maynard Amarine. He was a professor at UC Davis, really well known in the California wine circles as well. He was one of the people that sort of uh, uh, made the the heat index for California that began classifying where and how you should grow grapes in different climates, right? So looking at somewhere like Napa Valley and saying Calistoga is the hottest, this is the best area for grapes like Cabernet Sauvignon and Zinfandel. Carneros is the coolest. This is the best region in Napa for grapes like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, right? So part of the Amarine Winkler scale, one of those professors. Um, so he came in and started bringing in uh, new styles of winemaking um, and also mostly improving the quality, the hygiene. We're looking at ripping out a lot of vines, uh, planting better clones of better grape varieties. And a lot of them were international. So Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, Pinot Noir, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Chardonnay, Riesling, right? All of these things really came into Bulgaria during this time. This was also a time that we were getting over Gorbachev's anti-alcohol reform, which really heavily impacted both Romania and Bulgaria. Um, in the 90s, the collapse of the communist regime really led us to move forward with the new world model, of kind of soft, fruity style of wine uh, made from international grape varieties. And I think that today, this is really kind of what Bulgaria is known for on the kind of the global market. But there is a lot of really interesting winemaking happening with the indigenous grapes in the region as well. Um, one of the other things that can be really confusing about the, the wine regions of Bulgaria is that we list five here, but only two are officially recognized by the EU. Um, there's 52 total zones that you can use on your bottle of Bulgarian wine, but most producers don't choose to use those. So really in Bulgaria, it's considered that the name of the estate is the best. Uh, that's really what you should kind of take a look at. Um, and then we're learning a little bit more because you can see how large these overarching regions are. We're learning a little bit more about the grape varieties, uh, the indigenous varieties and the quality um, due to the climate that these wines have in these regions. So, so we really see most wines labeled with um, one of these five larger regions. Um, and then you might see them labeled with the name of a village as well. So they're telling you these are like the major wine growing villages that you do see within these larger regions. So the Danubian Plain, we see a lot of um, white wine coming out of this region. Uh, there's a, a producer named Borgozone. They're located up here um, right, on, right on the Danube River. They're, I think, one of the more common that you might see making international grape varieties, but their wines are imported into the U.S. Um, and they're good. Um, I wouldn't go as far to be like, you're kind of using a name that's a play on Burgundy. <laughs> um, you're making Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. I wouldn't go to as far to be like, I would make, mistake this wine for Burgundy, but, but the quality really is quite good. And they're really trying to increase the quality of the wines. And they're looking at a lot of the terroir specificity of their grape varieties as well, and looking to um, incorporate more of the uh, indigenous grapes. So some of the villages you might see in the Danubian Plain, uh, Sitov and Suhindo. The Thracian Lowlands is, um, these are the two 
recognized by the EU. The Danubian Plain and the Thracian Lowland. Um, Sungalor is an area within the Rhodes Valley. It's kind of a subset of the Thracian Lowlands that um, you see a lot of more of the um, um, in, uh, indigenous grape varieties coming from the Thracian Lowlands, aside from the Struma River Valley. Um, it really is an interesting place to the a small, so Sofia is, is in the, the western part of the country, the capital, one of the largest cities. Um, but there's a small village here. It's called, um, it starts with a P. Maybe it's like Podrica, or maybe I'm remembering that from another one. But there's they have a really cool uh, wine bar scene. And a lot of like, you know, that kind of camaraderie of those younger kind of more hip producers who are making like kind of natural styles of wine from the local grape varieties, which we're going to discuss in a moment. Um, and it really is a, a really fun and exciting time for these wines. If you do go to any of these regions, I really, one of the reasons we wanted to do this class is because I really wanted to, um, inspire a hope that people will seek out, feel comfortable when they're traveling in some of these regions, seeking out some of the, the local wines, right? If, you know, it might be comfortable to go with the Chardonnay, the Pinot Noir, the Riesling, and those wines might be very good. Um, but I think it's also really exciting to try some of these other grape varieties. I mean, when talking to Laura, I was gonna mention this earlier, um, you know, she we were just talking about the concept of, you know, there's not a ton of really high quality, uh, wine coming from the Balkans that are really available in the U.S. right now, which is quite unfortunate. Um, but, she, you know, she said something that was really insightful. She said something like, you know, sometimes that the, the thought or the memory of a wine that inspires the journey, meaning, you know, if, again, kind of the idea if you like history and food and and culture and wine, then any of these countries in the Balkans would be for you to travel in. So you also see the Black Sea region on the eastern coast. Um, you see, sometimes you can see more uh, lighter aromatic grape varieties here. So we would say Riesling, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, of course. The Struma River Valley is a really interesting place um, that I think doesn't get quite enough interest in the style of its wine, uh, known for a grape called um, uh, Melnik, uh, Shiroka Melnik, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, this producer Orbelis is coming from the Struma River Valley, and they actually make really quite cool wine coming from uh, the Melnik grape. The Rhodes Valley, that sub appellation of uh, the Thracian Lowlands that I mentioned. Uh, if you're traveling in Bulgaria, uh, Rhodes is a very, very common scent. Uh, in the country. So you probably come back with gifts of like rose oil and, you know, rose scented candies and cakes and things like that as well. What are some of the terms that can help you navigate the Bulgarian wines? Uh, well, now you know the region. So let's talk about some, some of the terms you might see um, and then some of the grape varieties as well that are not international. So if you see barrique, it means that the wine has been fermented in oak cask of 500 liters or less. Uh, this usually will be a style of new oak wine. Um, the, when I traveled in the country for wine, um, it was a very, uh, <laughs> it was a, a very, very fast paced trip. In four days, um, I, we flew in and out of Sofia. Uh, we went to the Thracian Lowland, almost over all the way to the Black Sea, up here to the border of, um, of Romania, and then back down to Sophia. So, I mean, it was a pretty, pretty big trip for, for four days, spent a lot of time in the car, tasted a lot of different styles of wine. And I was told that uh, when Bulgaria really started opening back up and increasing interest in its wine industry, that the EU subsidized um, new oak barrels for Bulgaria. And so this was one of the reasons that they just started making their wine in a very kind of new world oak style. So it's the fact that they got these oak barrels for free, um, uh, Maynard Amarine came in and he introduced this, you know, kind of like softer, riper style of winemaking that was made and done in California. And this really uh, sort of set the tone for the style of wine that they made for the next 20 or 30 years. You might see reserve indicating a year of age, special selection indicating two years of age. What does this mean? We all know that as the wine ages in bottle, it loses some of that fresher fruit and it's replaced with more savory or tertiary flavors and aromas. Um, red grapes account for more than half of Bulgaria's acreage, so kind of the flip of what we see in Romania. International grape varieties, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, um, lead plantings. 
Another common grape to see is Gamza, which is the same grape we know as Kadarka, known for bold blood and somewhere like Hungary. Um, and, you know, bold blood is always known for being like a really like rich style of wine. Um, but in Bulgaria, I don't know if it's just the way they make it or if it's a different clone, but Kadarka really is more kind of like medium bodied. Like it's kind of like this Blaufunkish or Esque style, it's kind of light and bright and juicy and a little peppery with a lot of red fruit. Um, Mavrud is really becoming Bulgaria's flagship uh, red indigenous grape variety. Um, they're really coping to make this uh, kind of the best grape, the one that a lot of producers uh, bank on in Bulgaria, one that becomes recognized by wine consumers around the world. It tends to be pretty versatile, although it can be quite robust. And because of that versatility and that robustness, it can be made for rosés, sometimes lighter, fresher styles of red, depending on where it's grown. It can be used for sparkling wines, um, but also can still be used uh, for oak styles and uh, more reserve or special selection styles of wine as well. Uh, Shiroka Melnik uh, tend to be quite tannic. Uh, it's pretty much exclusively cultivated in the Struma River Valley, this area here. It's closer to Greece. It's a little bit more uh, Mediterranean in its climate as well. Um, this is the wine that I mentioned, that winery Orbelis. Uh, Shiroka Melnik really can be a, a really great high quality grape. There's a lot of organic producers located in the Struma River Valley as well, probably because of that easier climate that um, allows us to grow more organic grapes, right? Um, and there's uh, some other different types of Melnick that you might see uh, that are sort of like hybrids or crossings um, that were made for higher production. So Shiroka Melnik is really the one you want to look for when you're in Bulgaria looking for this grape variety. Um, the other ones are like they say things like early Melnick or Melnick 55 or, or things like that. And those are kind of the, the, the more inferior uh, crossings of the Melnick grape. So definitely look for the Shiroka. Uh, Pamid, very thin skin grape. We mentioned this in Romania, really fresh, youthful consumption. And then Rubin shows a lot of promise, great potential. So it's a crossing in Bulgaria of Nebbiolo and Syrah. Um, and it retains some of the structure um, and tannin profile, some, not all, of Nebbiolo, but a little bit more of like the, the pepper and spice of something like Syrah. So there's really some interesting, there's not a ton of, you know, most of the grape planted are still these international red varieties. I mean, Mavrid, even for their flagship red grape, or that they want it to be their flagship red grape, is still only like two or three percent of planting. So um, the rest of these grapes are, are in pretty low production at the moment. For white grapes, uh, Arcazzatelli coming from Georgia, Dimiat are the most planted and a grape called Red Miscat. Uh, Miscat, which is a really uh, aromatic style of wine and people will compare it to Muscat, although it doesn't actually have uh, any direct relationship to Muscat as well. So moving up to Slovenia, uh, this has become quickly one of the most modernized uh, wine producing countries to emerge from Yugoslavia. They were one of the first to join the EU. Um, that's a good question. So I'm just looking at the chat and Lindsay's asking about if any of these um, are the same grapes as Greece with different names. And, and not that I know that, but I, um, not that I know of, um, but you wouldn't be surprised, right? because we do know that some of these, these because grapes do not understand political boundaries. Um, and I think actually Slovenia is the perfect example of that. Um, Slovenia is a very, very rapidly improving producer of wine. There are three regions that you'll primarily see um, on your bottle. So Primorska, it borders freely. Um, I just, you know, kind of Lindsay, that was the perfect segue because as I mentioned, grapes don't know political boundaries. So Many producers located either in Friuli, which is here, um, or in Slovenia, here, um, in Goriska Barda, have, vine have vineyards on both sides of the border. So they pick grapes in Italy, they pick grapes in Slovenia. Um, Els Kristancic uh, of Movia is one of the producers that's really well known for this, but there's also like Josko Gravner as well. Um, also really common to pick grapes in both Italy and in Slovenia. Uh, the, the climate is much more Mediterranean here, very similar to what you get in that part of um, Northeastern Italy as well. Uh, the grapes are primarily Italian with 
uh, Slovenian name to them. So Rafosk, the Italian Rafosco, Rabula, the Italian Rabula Gialla. Just like in Italy, you see Rabula made in both the kind of fresh, light, uh, drinkable white wine styles with no skin contact, but it also, it, it really does well as an orange wine style too. So you'll see Rabula is both a white and an orange, just like in Friuli. Uh, Civi Pino is what we call our Pinot Grigio right across the border in Slovenia. But then we also do see those international grape varieties, um, Cabernet Merlot, of course, um, some other indigenous whites as well. Uh, Podravi is in the excuse me, the extreme Northeast. Uh, this is the largest region with seven subzones. Um, a lot of white wine produced here uh, from uh, international grape varieties, uh, but they tend to be like fresh, crisp, but still aromatic whites. Uh, so Gewürztraminer, Riesling, you see Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, uh, Welsh Riesling as well. And Posavi uh, in the South, it's on the border with um, Croatia, which we'll talk about next. Um, and they, they took quite a large region overall, um, but they don't have a ton of grapes growing in this region. So the most important really is Primorska um, and the most important subzone. I mean, all of these are, you know, we have like Karst, like across from Karso, Gris Kabarda, across from Friuli uh, and Vipava. These are kind of the top three subzones that you see in uh, Primorska as well. Fun stuff, guys. I hope you're really inspired to drink some <laughs> Balkan wines. So as we're moving to Croatia, I, you know, I feel like Croatia is uh, an area that it's definitely much more tourist in, set up better for tourism. Um, I've only been to Croatia one time, um, but just also in the winter, but it's really just um, all of the Balkans, I just found to be very, very welcoming, especially during the winter to my cousin and I who were traveling alone. Um, we were young <laughs> and not traveling with a lot of money. So um, we really, you know, lovely to meet so many people in our travels. And I have many friends that I'm still in contact with that I, that I met um, on this trip that I stayed for several years as well, which is why I've been back to places like Serbia, you know, two or three times to go visit some of these friends that I've met. Um, so Croatia, we have four main regions, um, sort of the, the Croatian upland, Istria um, and Kvarna, which is here in the north. Um, and then we have the Dalmatia coast as well. Up here, we see more white grape varieties. And down here, these are the two most common regions that I see in the US, uh, whites in the north and more red in the south. Um, the coast of Croatia stretches all the way from the Italian border, um, all the way south to Montenegro. So you have these two non-contiguous zones, Istria, um, where white wine is dominant, primarily based on um, its own sort of, um, its own ver variant of Malvasia. So also tends to be, you know, a little bit aromatic, but also really crisp and fresh and salty, has some beautiful like kind of orange and white floral characteristics to it. Uh, in Dalmatia, we see an interest in red grape varieties, uh, but also a resurgence of Zinfandel, Cerulianac Cash um, and its and its offshoot or its protege, uh, Plavak Mali. So Plavak Mali is really one of the most common red wines that I think you might find coming out of Croatia. You'll see the Zinfandel as its original name, Cerulianac Cash or also as its um, its really ancient name, which is known as Tribadrag. Um, and so we probably talked about this in some of these uh, other classes, but, you know, Mike Gergic um, was the winemaker in Napa Valley who was making wine at Chateau Montalena um, when they won the 1976 Judgment of Paris. He had made the wine that won. Uh, he was a native Croatian. He came to the U.S. from Cro Croatia. And when he was living in Napa for years, he made comments that the Zinfandel grape the leaves and the grape variety looks like something very similar um, to where he came from in Croatia. And he never really like put two and two together, but he just noted it. But when Carol Meredith was um, a plant geneticist at UC Davis and she was beginning to research the relationship between different grape varieties and her work is the reason that we know that Zinfandel is this grape variety. Her work is the region that we know that, um, you know, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, or excuse me, that Cabernet Sauvignon is the offspring of 
uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc. Like we never would have known any of these things before. She she really developed um, the technology that helps us look at the 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 off offspring parent um, offspring relationship between the different grape varieties. So his personal recollection of these kind of coastal vineyards um, and these these wines that were very similar to Zinfandel led Carol Meredith to Croatia. And she was eventually able to establish the correlation between these two grape varieties. They are the same thing. Also the same as uh, Primitivo coming from Puglia in Italy. So, you know, here's the Adriatic. <laughs> Just over here, as you saw on the initial map is Italy, right? You really didn't have that far to go in this case. Just to, just to hop over the sea to Italy. And then it, all it took was uh, some Italians coming to the new world to make their fortune, right? Uh, so some of the other Balkan countries uh, are, you know, the, the, the infrastructure for making wine and also getting wine out um, into the global market. Uh, it's not very developed. It's not as strong yet. Uh, so, you know, we have a few things that we can talk about these regions. You might notice that, you know, we really try to make it so that we have cohesive maps when we do our classes. Um, <laughs> and you might notice that these are not cohesive, cohesive at all. And that just really is due to the fact that, you know, there's not one kind of map you know, wine person that's really making all of these maps. Quentin Sadler did, did a great um, series of Balkan countries, not all of them, but some of the wine regions, like especially Bulgaria, Romania, um, but he has his logo on them. So I was just trying to find nice ones to use, um, but you'll notice that they're not all the same. And for some of them, we don't even have a wine map. For example, the Kosovo is a really good example of that. This is a wine map. It's just a map of the country. So I can show you where you might find some of the vineyards here. So North Macedonia, uh, recently since 2019, they were changed its name or up, upgraded, updated its name to the Republic of North Macedonia due to uh, their dispute with Greece. Uh, it is a very historical region that at one time covered large parts of both Greece and Bulgaria as well. Under the rule of uh, Philip II and Alexander the Great, it was considered to be one of the most powerful states in the entire world during its time, uh, kind of the 300 um, BC. It became part of the Roman Empire and then was under Ottoman rule for five centuries until 1913. So, you know, really um, under Ottoman rule for quite a long time. And then post-World War II, uh, part of Yugoslavia until 1992. Uh, in terms of the wine area, you know, and I, I'm just going to interrupt myself here because one of the things that I thought was so fascinating was I was kind of like, oh, we're going to do this cool class on the Balkans and like all we're going to have to talk about is uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Romania. So I'm like, of course, they make wine everywhere and in all of these different regions. But because of my travels in the country, like I, I know that many of these countries are also have a, a large um, Muslim population. Uh, Islam is one of the dominant languages, or excuse me, uh, religions, especially in some of these, uh, like Albania, uh, Kosovo, different parts of, of Macedonia as well. They have a high like Albanian Muslim population up there. You know, I think Macedonia, their um, Albanian population is like 25%. So uh, there's a lot of uh, Islamic influence in the, the Balkan countries as well. So I was thinking, you know, there's not going to be a lot of wine because they have a culture that uh, doesn't necessarily approve of drinking alcohol. But when I really started to look into it, that's just not true at all. Um, there's a great culture around both beer and wine in, in many of these countries. And it's really just for us to pay attention and, and begin to seek them out, especially if we do go here. Um, so in Macedonia, so usually you're, especially even on the news, you're pretty much going to hear to it referred as Macedonia. It's not usually by the full name. Um, the Vidar River uh, area near Skopje in the center of the country is the most important. Um, you'll also see quite a bit of vineyards along uh, Lake Okrid on the uh, western border with Albania as well. They also focus primarily on red production here. Uh, this is a grape we haven't talked about yet, uh, Vranak, but Vranak is a very important grape variety in the Balkans. Um, it is a, a kind of a fully bodied um, uh, kind of beefy style, uh, thick skinned, you know, medium plus tannin style of wine definitely has a, a more 
structured and round mouth feel to it. Um, so Vernock is going to be one of the dominant red grapes. Um, and, and most of the remaining countries we'll talk about. Uh, Cratosia, or also known as Zinfandel, uh, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, as well as some other uh, indigenous grape varieties. For white, one of the coolest white grapes that we see in Montenegro um, and in Macedonia is this grape called Zelavka. Um, so we're going to talk about Zelavka in a moment, but you'll see Zuplianka, uh, Chem, Tem, Temi, Temianika, uh, and <laughs> Medurevka. If you guys want to chime in on some of the pronunciation, please do. Um, Kosovo as well, the country with a history of wine for more than 2000 years. Uh, currently, they only have about 35 uh, hectares of 3,500 hectares of vineyards, um, but incredibly mountainous. And this is true for all of the kind of southern Balkan countries. So uh, Montenegro, Macedonia, Kosovo, um, Albania are all very, very mountainous. Just like keep that in mind. What does that mean? Usually that means that we have a lot of potential for high quality, high elevation grape growing, right? So a lot of the vineyards um, in Kosovo sit between three and 400 meters in elevation. Uh, there are actually 18 distinct wine regions, but nearly 90% of the vineyards are in the southern part of the country. Um, and this zone down here, so unfortunately, this map isn't quite. So this is this is uh, uh, Pristina, which is the capital of Kosovo. Down here, you have this uh, really beautiful village called the city called Prizren. And you have um, this area here, the majority of where you find the wine production um, in Kosovo at this time. So again, primarily red production, Vranak, um, a local, a grape that's local to Serbia called uh, Prokupa. It's one of Serbia's kind of most well-known red grapes as well, um, and also international grape varieties. So Kosovo is, um, you know, it's an area where there's been a lot of um, conflict, a lot of like kind of, you know, war and conflict with Serbia as well, because they did declare themselves independent in 2008, um, and, and not Serbia and not every other country uh, around the world recognizes that independence yet. Montenegro, in, extremely mountainous, a small country on the uh, Adriatic coast. We have a much more Mediterranean climate here, um, especially because the two main zones are for wine production are just the coastal zone. So we're on the sea, on the Adri Adriatic, and also the Lake Skidar Basin. So um, it's a really, really large lake uh, in the kind of south central area of the country. Um, we have two main subregions that we see in Lake Skidar. 80% uh, of the wines that are produced are red. Uh, Vranak that we mentioned before, this is an indigenous grape to Montenegro that's spread throughout the, the Balkans. Uh, Kratosia, that is Zinfandel again, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, a host of indigenous white grapes along with Chardonnay and Arcatzatelli coming from uh, Georgia as well, just across the Black Sea. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, again, a real crossroad of cultural influence. And they were hit really hard by the, the Balkan Wars in the 1990s. And the consequences of the war are, are really still noticeable today when you go to um, places like Mostar, especially, which had been really heavily rebuilt. But you still see a lot of the, the shellings in the sidewalk, in the side of the building, the bullet holes in the sides of the building. It's really a, a beautiful city to visit. And the people there are in, really incredibly friendly. And, and even though the history is, is quite sad, they're re really open to sharing it with you. Um, and then if you go to Sar Sarajevo as well, you're probably familiar with something known as like the Sarajevo Roses, where the, the shelling, where the, sh the mortar mortars hit the sidewalks and created small craters that they filled them in with red paint. They call them the Sarajevo Roses. So a lot of um, conflict within this area, uh, but seeing a resurgence in winemaking, there's only 3,200 hectares under vine. Um, there's about 50 wineries in the country, but only like 30 are really commercially relevant within Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, but there is an estimated 11,000 households who grow grape for home winemaking. So what will this mean? I mean, to me, this is really exciting because, uh, well, we know that not everybody that grows grapes can make great wine. We know that, of course, even if you're starting with good grapes. Um, but it really means that there's a history and a tradition here. And this is really what we saw in Georgia across the Black Sea, where uh, under, under, Soviet, uh, under Soviet rule there, 
they really develop their tradition of home winemaking um, that with their kind of their crevery style, their indigenous grapes, their orange wines or their amber wines that they were making within Georgia. Um, and so I think we might have a country that's poised on the kind of the edge of, of really exploding their wine industry if they have enough interest from like the outside global market, right? Uh, so 65% of the production there is based on the indigenous grape uh, Zilavka. I mentioned Zilavka before. It is a really interesting, cool white wine, white grape that makes this like a really fresh, high acid style of wine that has enough texture that you can certainly make it in like a richer, waxier style with oak if you wanted to do that. It's not uncommon to use a uh, local Balkan oak that you find within the region. It's kind of like almost like Slovenian or Hungarian where it tends to be uh, it doesn't have as much aromatic impact as like American or maybe some of the French oak that you might see as well. Uh, we had the Lavka um, by the bottle for a while or by the glass. We actually sold it by the glass several years ago at Cork Buzz. And it was um, uh, kind of almost like Chablis-esque, the style that we had. It had a lot of like bright lemon curd, kind of hazelnut characteristics to it. Um, it was really a, a lovely wine. So moving into Serbia, we're in... I think the only landlocked uh, country in the Balkans, There's no sea access here, um, but there are a lot of large rivers that do help moderate the climate in Serbia as well. Winemaking was established here pretty heavily in the early Middle Ages um, when Serbia went through its conversion to Christianity, um, but it was really hindered by the Ottoman period. Uh, 20th century, we saw the development of a lot of really large co-ops um, and under, you know, Yugoslavia, under Tito, they suffered a lot from the viol more violent wars, a lot of the ethnic conflicts as well that have been prevalent, unfortunately, here, um, and also sometimes ongoing. So right now they have about 300 registered producers and 30,000 hectares under vine. This was a really big surprise to me by comparison to some of the other countries, because I've seen Bosnia and Herzegovina wine in the US. I've seen wine from Macedonia. I've seen, I can't, I don't think I've seen wine from uh, Montenegro, but definitely from Croatia and Slovenia. Those are much, much more common. But to find out that Serbia has produced, had 30,000 30, hectares and 300 registered producers, I was like, why aren't we getting any of these wines? Um, so I'd really be, be interested to see if, uh, you know, the quality is really there, if it's improving, what's going on. There's 20 wine regions, um, but there's two kind of major regions that are important at the moment. Uh, the Tri Morave it includes the basin of the three Morava rivers um, converging, converging down here. You have Belgrade. Belgrade, the capital, is, is just up here. Um, and then the Negotinska uh, Krahina. So this is in northeast Serbia um, on the border of Bulgaria. It's not really quite northeast, it's kind of like the east. Mid-East, I would actually call it here on the border of Bulgaria with the Danube over here. Um, and this was an area that was really well known, especially in the 19th century, the wines were exported to Western Europe um, and they really enjoyed um, a high reputation during that time as well. And I think this might be the last one. Okay, and Albania. Uh, so this is really the country that I would like they're not gonna, we're not gonna find any wine in Albania, but I really found some fascinating, fascinating information, um, especially in one specific winery that I wanted to share. I might tomorrow when I send out the follow-up, I might send um, some information on some other wineries that I don't know are necessarily available in the US, but there's some of, some of the larger producers um, or some of the more interesting monastery producers as well, um, just like other places like Georgia, other places in Eastern Europe. Um, there's still monasteries that take care of viticulture and make wine in certain places as well. Um, but I'm gonna talk about one producer here in a moment in Albania. Uh, it's a very, again, an incredibly small mountainous country, um, a very, very long viticultural history. We've been making wine, wine here since the eighth century um, before the common area. Um, era um, by tribes. Viticulture really flourished all over the country until the Ottoman invasion, which is surprising because it is so incredibly mountainous. Um, 
the country would never part of Yugoslavia, um, but viticulture really slowed under the communist leadership of Enver Hoda. Um, he was really, really an isolationist. He didn't allow a very much outside uh, contact with the rest of the world. Um, it was a very, very insular, very protected area. Now, you know, kind of one of the things that's interesting, um, kind of in spite uh, or despite, in spite of communism, is that, you know, maybe this sort of isolation from so many other places is, is sort of maybe one of the things that helped retain a lot of these indigenous grape varieties in some of these smaller vineyards. Um, that's kind of like a, you know, a little bit of speculation and, and that's the, the best scenario of uh, a worst situation kind of outcome, right? But, um, but this could, have, could be one of the, the effects of that as well. So very Mediterranean climate, but only a, a quarter of the land is suitable for agriculture, even though half of the population of Albania make their living from agriculture. There are 35,000 farms, but the average size of the farms for agriculture is less than one hectare. So really tiny, um, small, fractured plots of land. There are 10,000 hectares of vine planted, uh, mostly are pergola or sometimes trained up trees as well. Um, mentioned the kind of isolation, very rich in indigenous grape varieties. Um, the most common, or not the most common, but one of the most interesting whites that I've really heard of is this grape here. Uh, it, I think it would be pronounced, I, I don't know if it's Albanian, because I know a lot of the other, um, the pronunciations of the J and in, in the other kind of Northern Balkan countries is usually an I, but the Albanian language is quite different. So it could be Seruja or Seruja. Um, we have red indigenous grape, Kalmet, uh, also known as Kadarka, that bold blood that we see coming from Hungary as well. They have both wild vines as well as international grape varieties planted as well. The main growing regions are Fier in the north, which is the largest, uh, Vlor in the south, and Elbasan located in the center. And one of the most interesting, I mean, I doubt that you would see, I, I don't know, I've never seen a bottle of Albanian wine, so I have no idea if you would see any of these main growing regions listed on the label. I would say it's probably more common you would see one of these grape varieties. Um, but Uka Farm is a really interesting project that I came across uh, researching this class. So. They're an organic uh, farm and winery on the outskirts of Tirana. Um, they operate a, so Tirana is the capital, it's kind of located almost right here in the center. You can see it with the star. Um, they have a farm restaurant uh, and the farm and winery is located just on the outskirts of Tirana. Uh, they started as a, just an agricultural farm. Um, I believe that the, the gentleman who started, the Uka family, the gentleman who started was uh, one of Albania's first um, like kind of ministers of agriculture within the country. So obviously really important to him. Um, Flori Uka started making um, wine in 2005 at the property. He trained in Italy to make wine before coming back. And the focus is really on Albanian indigenous grape varieties. Um, this is actually a, a photo from the farm here. This is the Ceru Ceruja grape um, and it's grown to, it, grown to train up trees, um, mulberry trees, and then you climb ladders and you actually pick the grapes from the vines that are actually growing from the, the branches of the mulberry tree. It's a really interesting way. Uh, but they really primarily focus with uh, these indigenous grapes and they don't own any of their own vineyards. So they work with more than 200 rural families and growers all over the country. Um, they support these growers and preserve a lot of the heritage of these kind of like small plots of not just vineyards that would be abandoned, but other forms of agriculture in the area too. So I think what they're doing is uh, really interesting that they're preserving these grapes and making wine, but more importantly, that they're working with a lot of these uh, smaller growers in the areas as well. Thank you. Um, I really hope that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, you know, I really hope that you have the opportunity to to maybe look into visiting some of these regions um, in the Balkans. I know sometimes these classes are a little hard to follow because you're like, well, here's the name of like 50 indigenous grape varieties that you now need to remember. But really we don't, we don't want to present it that way that you, know, you have to remember the name of all of these grape varieties. It's more of the opportunity to understand that when you're seeing these grape varieties, if you go to a place, these wines are not expensive. They're, they're really quite inexpensive 
they're they're really quite cheap for the cost. Uh, so it's definitely your dollar goes a long way and it's not going to hurt you to go out to a restaurant if you're going to Montenegro, if you're going to Serbia, if you're going to Albania and and, you know, pick a few bottles of these wines and be able to taste through them. I definitely would recommend it and I would always, of course, love to hear your opinion and what you have to say about it. I wish Mary was still here. I'd love to hear some of her opinions um, since she goes, she said she goes to the country so often. Well, Amber, thank you. Quick, quick question. Is their techniques any different in those countries? Uh, their winemaking techniques? Or are they more, do they follow more of what you would see in Spain and France and the more more modern techniques. I think the biggest difference is that they really, in a lot of places, increase the hygiene in the wineries. Um, so, so they're not there's not a big um, there is kind of in Slovenia because that style had become popular to age wine in like Amphora or Crevery, like Georgia. Um, but I haven't seen that as really being the technique in a lot of these countries. Um, you know, Bulgaria especially really kind of moved into like the more kind of modern California technique of winemaking. But I think in a lot of the other countries, it's, they're still making it in a, a pretty classical method of, of making wine. Because I, I kept thinking about Georgia and, you know, Armenia, you know, Azerbaijan and, you know, you go across the Black Sea and they're putting, you know, making clay pots and clay vessels. And mm -hmm. I didn't know if they were following any of those techniques or it was more of the Western European style. Yeah, I think a little bit more of like the Western European okay. style, as far as I understand. Very nice. Thank you. This was great. Very educational. I loved it. Thank you. It was so nice to see everybody. I hope you all have a great night. I'll see you soon. Bye.